CMQ Investors, Alibaba is now priced at $92.92 per share. I just got done hyperventilating in my bathroom and uh, we need to talk about it because I'm receiving a lot of DMs, a lot of tweets, and I wanna make sure I, I give you some perspective and hopefully some wisdom that we can all use to make sure we don't panic sell and we keep the big picture in mind. I wanna start off by saying, you know, my investment in Alibaba is my investment in Alibaba. You need to do what's right for you. This is never financial advice. I'm just sharing my experiences and, and being transparent about it. But I was reminded today, and this happened completely by coincidence, after I got done hyperventilating uh, for the first time today, I was reminded of this book, The Money Masters, and it's written by John Train. And the reason I own it, it was, I think, published in 1980, is Warren Buffett had recommended it um, at a Berkshire meeting from many years ago. I don't remember the exact year, but the, uh, the point is there is a, a section in here, or one of the people who's profiled as a money master is Phil Fisher. Now, Phil Fisher is a legendary investor, and he's, I would say, in addition to Benjamin Graham, he had the greatest influence on both the investment approaches of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Uh, Charlie Munger, who happens to be a big-time bull of Alibaba. So I want to share with you something that I, again, came across completely, almost coincidentally today, that I think is very relevant to this conversation about Alibaba, and it's something that has helped me from panic selling today, which I honestly, I was tempted to do. So let me share with you what this is. And this again is about uh, from the Money Masters. It says, and let me find the exact part here. Okay, great. Fisher argues that the usual way investors buy is silly. They sift through masses of economic data, conclude that the, fav conclude that the business outlook is favorable and invest. Almost all investment letters from brokers start out this way. The economic outlook is good or bad, so one should buy stocks or hold off on buying stocks until the outlook clarifies. While this may sound persuasive in theory, it's impossible to apply in practice. Economic forecasting is not yet far enough advanced to permit long range predictions. And I would say that, you know, it reminds me of something I always try to remind myself, which is time in the market beats timing the market. We don't have a chance of timing the market. It's just, it's a fool's game. Fisher compares it to chemistry during the days of alchemy. In chemistry then, as in business forecasting now, basic principles were just beginning to emerge from a mysterious mass of mumbo jumbo. However, chemistry had not reached a point where such principles could be safely used as a basis for choosing a course of action. Fisher wistfully speculates on how much, uh, how much might be accomplished if the investment community, unlike the alchemists and theologians in the Middle Ages, could apply all the time spent turning out contradictory economic forecasts to something useful. Okay, now we're gonna get into a little bit more of the, I, I think of it as like Alibaba specific uh, points here. I would go one step further than Fisher. Not only are forecasts fatuous in themselves, but they usually echo each other and produce a consensus. The investor who holds off until there's a wave of optimism among the profits, particularly the banks, is buying with the crowd and thus paying higher prices. Further, bull markets end and bear markets begin in good times when everybody's optimistic. The bottom comes in bad times when everybody's desperate. The crash, meaning the crash of 1929, after all, started amid universal euphoria in 1929, and the greatest buying point in history was when the banks closed in 1932. The market doubled in two months. So really, the investor is safest doing the opposite of what any Wall Street consensus indicates. Far from waiting to invest until the bank's long-term economic overview has turned favorable. He should try to hold off until a full-scale recession is in progress and the banks and economists say that all is lost. Then he can get solid assets for 50 cents on the dollar and outstanding growth stocks at prices that do not reflect their uniqueness. Now, I want to share a little bit more here because I think it just, it's still relevant, but uh, bear with me. I know if you're not a fan of uh, me reading to you, um, then the, my next podcast, I'll actually be reading children's books and bedtime stories. Okay. To use my language rather than his, Fisher is always looking for the double play. A company's earnings rise, the market gives a higher price earnings multiple to those higher earnings, the stock soars. The investor must therefore be aware of the facts and the perceptions. If the facts are more favorable than the perceptions, sooner or later, the investment community will catch on, the perception will change, and the stock will rise. Let's, let's read that one more time. Let's bring that back. DJ, bring it back. The investor must therefore be aware of the facts and the perceptions. If the facts are more favorable than the perceptions, sooner or later, the investment community will catch on. 
the perception will change and the stock will rise. So should I sell Alibaba? The answer is no, because the fundamentals, the reasons that I invested have not changed right now. I mean, China, just like in the United States, the market is extremely volatile. There's a tremendous uncertainty, but this is something I said this in a podcast earlier today. I really feel like this is us paying dues as long-term shareholders. Obviously, if you know Alibaba was like Rivian and you know didn't really make any money and it was much more of a bet on some huge thing in the future where they haven't actually proven they can deliver on it, I wouldn't be singing the same song. Alibaba is not Rivian. It's a very different type of company when you actually get into the numbers. Um, there is a section and it comes right after what I just read called when to sell. So let's conclude with that. One of Fisher's most famous utterances on this subject is this. If the job has been done correctly when a common stock is purchased, the time to sell is almost never. He gives two exceptions. If it's Alibaba. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. <laughs> if it's a company in China that specializes in e-commerce with a growing cloud computing company, sell it. No, let me be serious now, okay? Because this is very serious, very serious. First, if it turns out that you made a mistake in your original appraisal. Second, if the company ceases to qualify under the same appraisal method. The old management may lose its drive or newer management may not uh, be as able. Alternatively, a company may get so big in its own market that it cannot do much better than its industry or indeed the economy as a whole. A third exception, which Fisher considers rarely valid, is that you discover a particularly attractive new opportunity, such as a company with great promise of a sustained 20% annual earnings gain and to buy it, you decide to cut back on a holding with lesser growth prospects. However, you probably know less about the new company than the old one, about which you have been learning more and more for years. So there is a risk of making a mistake. You cannot, after all, know almost everything that could be important about more than a few companies. And this is such an important point, guys. It's something I've been talking a lot about when I was asked questions this week about you know my take on commodities and shorting stocks. And I said, I don't really even try to play those games because for me, it's all about the businesses and trying to focus in on understanding what makes a good business good, what makes a bad business bad, and why. And there's so many potential businesses to look at. When I narrow it down based on my circle of competence, based on what I believe is, you know, there's a few other different filters that we can talk about at another time. I still have a lot of work to do to become, I think, knowledgeable enough to be a common shareholder, especially a common shareholder for the long term. So that's a great point. And again, I'm so glad I just opened this book up today. Um, those years of increasing familiarity, Fisher urges, should not be thrown away. He also denies that, notice how he said those years of increasing familiarity, just, you know, next time you read a 10K and buy a stock on the spot, think about that. He also denies that you should sell because you think that the stock is too high priced or it's gotten ahead of itself or because the whole market is due for a slide. Again, you can't time the market. Selling for either reason implies that you are clever enough to buy the stock back more cheaply later but in practice, you almost always miss the stock when it recovers. In addition, you have the capital gains tax to pay. By the way, this sounds so much like what Charlie Munger has said over the years, which is, you know, I, I know I mentioned that Phil Fisher has been an enormous influence on both Charlie and Warren, but I think, you know, especially on, on Charlie Munger in terms of, uh, you know, finding a great business, loading up on it, it you know, it's reasonably priced and holding it for as long as possible. And one of the reasons is, again, you know, you interrupt the compounding process when you have to pay your taxes. Uh, but pay your taxes when you do have to pay them, okay? Just as a public service announcement, do not try to not pay them. Okay, one more, uh, two more paragraphs here, guys. After all, if you've chosen the company properly in the first place with a reasonable prospect that in 10 years, say, the stock will have tripled or quadrupled, it is so important, uh, is it so important that it's 35% overpriced today? And there's always the possibility that the stock's price reflects good news you don't know about yet. Silliest of all, says Fisher, is selling out just because a stock has gone up a lot. The truly great company, the only kind he's interested in buying, will grow on and on, and its stock likewise. That it has advanced substantially since you bought it only means that everything is going just as it should. Now, that's not Alibaba right now. Alibaba's been you know, going down a, uh, a slippery slope that is, uh, I feel like Alibaba is like the, uh, the guy, the robbers in Home Alone slipping down the steps after Macaulay Culkin's character at, uh, you know, basically poured water on them and had a uh, very slippery situation for them to try to get out of. But that's just my brain. It makes me think of panic selling and Macaulay Culkin doing this. But um, yeah, I'm not selling my Alibaba shares. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm comfortable right now. This is, uh, I said on Twitter, um, you know, I think after this period of time where we've, you know, been living under this false idea that, you know, stocks only go up, 
uh, it's hard to see things you're buying just start going down or things you recently bought not even go up at all and just start heading down. That's something that takes getting used to and why it's so important to master your psychology as an investor. Um, and again, I do believe that going through these periods, this is part of what Charlie and Warren describe as the natural vicissitudes of life. Um, and I think are important to think about for us as like, it's like paying dues. Like this is what we have to endure to really benefit from long-term compounding. doesn't mean it has to happen with Alibaba. I mean, I could, Alibaba could go to zero and my content will become increasingly depressing, <laughs> but uh, you get the idea, I hope. So this was helpful to me. I hope it's helpful to you. Um, I'll have more to share from this book that I think just little nuggets of wisdom that I want to make sure I help spread and, and get out to you guys. But appreciate you listening. Appreciate you watching. Make sure you subscribe to the CMQ Investing Podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Subscribe on YouTube. It's CMQ Investing. Give this video a thumbs up if you're watching the video. I appreciate everyone for supporting the content, sharing the content. I hope it's continually, uh, it continues to be helpful to you. And I uh, wish you all the best in your stock pursuits. My name is Chris Franco. Once again, this has been CMQ Investing. We'll talk soon.